Book by book. Hey, I'm very, very pleased to be with you. I'm Richard Buse. There's Paul Blackham. There's George Verwer. We're sharing together in some genuine Bible study. We're studying this together. We're going to now the ninth uh, study in our series on the Acts of the Apostles. And we're going to look at uh, chapters 20 onwards. Uh, it's, of course, what we're doing is looking at the, the big picture of Acts. One of the things that we do, by the way, is to have a with us always, uh, accompanying every single program of uh, Bible study, this uh, little study guide. So on the Acts of the Apostles, you can have access to one of those. I'm quite sure if you're in a house group or something like that, or you're in a student seminar, or whatever, look out for the study guide. But we're going to do this live study right now, and we're in Acts chapter 20. And as we come to it, I'd like to ask straight away, well, let me read first of all, a little bit. There's an uproar going on. And... Uh, it goes on from there, then it says that from, uh, they come to a place called Miletus and Paul sends to the Ephesians uh, for the elders of the church. Verse 18, when they arrived, he said to them, you know how I lived the whole time I was with you. From the first day I came into the province of Asia, I served the Lord with great humility, with tears, although I was severely tested by the plots of the Jews. You know that I've not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. George Verwer, I've heard you describe Acts chapter 20 as the Mount Everest of the book of Acts. Why? Well, for me it is. Uh, this is one of the really influential passages in my life as a young Christian. I mentioned the other day how I read through the whole book of Acts in one night. And Acts chapter 20, especially verse 24, I sort of took it as my life verse. Since then, I got many life verses. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. If only I may finish the race and complete the task of the Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus give, has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. It's just, it's just dynamite. But the verses you've just read, I think we should just look at them momentarily very uh, quickly, I serve the Lord with great humility. What a lack of humility there is today. I find even among Christian leaders, you listen to them on television, you sometimes hear them speak, and arrogance comes across. There should be no arrogance in the work of God. And then denominationalism, people are so proud of their group, their denomination. We get that in missions as well. We should serve with humility. We should be quick to apologize, quick, quick to repent. And then with tears, I don't see much of that today either. And, and then, of course, severely tested by the plots of the Jews. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you. But I've taught you publicly. Somebody described this as 2020 vision. Public vision and house to house vision. Yeah. And I've heard pastors even boast they don't go house to house. They don't visit their own, uh, you know, members of their church. Some, somebody else must do that. They mainly preach. I mean, it's unreal. And so this to me is the core of spiritual revolution. And I'd urge people to feast on Acts chapter 20. Mm. Hey, Paul, it does you and me good as pastors to hear George talk, talking like that. Of course, present company is always excluded. <laughs> <laughs> no, cuts us down to size, absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's such a... He, Paul is on his way to Jerusalem. This is what's happening. Yeah. Why does he set his face yep. uh, towards Jerusalem, Paul, when, as in verse 10, uh, there's this prophet called Agabus who makes a prophecy about Paul, mm. that uh, the, the trouble that he's going to face there, and Paul's arrest and the behavior of the mob, why well, that seems to echo the trial and the arrest of Jesus. Yeah. Uh, why do followers of Jesus seem to get the same sort of treatment as him? Well, he, he, he's very... Because people often say, well, if he's got prophecies telling him that there's going to be trouble when he gets to Jerusalem, is it, should, he shouldn't go. He's telling him not to he's go. He's going on. Was, no, but if you think back to the mm. way of Jesus, there were prophecies from hundreds of years before he was even born telling him that when he got to Jerusalem there was going to be trouble for Jesus. And so Jesus knew what was going to happen. He even spoke about the, the suffering yeah. and persecution and death he was going to face at Jerusalem. 
And yet Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem, even though he knew it was going to happen, because that is where, that was his mission. He had to face that. He had to go into that. Paul's got the similar mentality that he's like, yeah, I know that's going to happen, but I'm going there anyway, because that's where my mission is taking me. So it's that, he's so like Jesus in that way. And then he gets into the trial and he's treated in the same way and he's hauled up and the mob's in front of him and the Roman governor's there. And you, it's just like a replay of the whole thing. And in a way, because t- if with Jesus, the whole mentality is if you're persecuted for my sake, you should be glad that you've been counted worthy and that you're, I, you're identified with me. I think yeah. that's what comes across is that Paul is really just like Jesus. And it's, that's why if they, if they rejected Jesus and Jesus is so, like Jesus said, if they rejected me and I'm the nicest person of all, they're definitely going to reject you guys. Yeah. And then eventually, if, I mean, Paul, did you want to add to that? No, it just, it's so powerful what yeah, he said. It is. Yeah. I mean, eventually Paul does get to Jerusalem. Uh, and on arriving there, he has to make his defense in the face of the rioting and the uproar that his presence causes. Uh, so as you look on at, uh, well, you, we have a bit here. I mean, in chapter 22, verse 1 to 21, um, Paul is giving his testimony to the crowd. And uh, George, I'd like to uh, uh, think with you, what lessons could we learn from Paul's defense in chapter 22? Uh, how can we use our own testimony as well, looking at Paul? Well, I think our testimony often is the most powerful thing we can share. Because Paul and, is simply retelling the Damascus Road, really. Yeah. And the very fact that Paul, throughout the scriptures, and especially Acts, uh, but Corinthians also tells us a lot about Paul, some of the most powerful descriptions of any disciple are found in describing Paul in Corinthians. And I just think there's a tremendous message for us. We, we need to be able to speak out. We need to be able to share our testimony. We shouldn't be intimidated. The very strong emphasis right here on proclamation, proclamation, I think will bring into balance that today the big emphasis is more and more is on p- people's physical needs. I believe in that with all my heart. But some groups are saying now, we, we don't have to proclaim. And we have this quotation about Saint, from St. Saint Francis Assisi, you know, only sort of speak when necessary. We that say, sounds we very speak. spiritual, <laughs> but it's unbiblical. No. We should be speaking in season and out of season. That's what the Bible says. That's and I right. think there's a lot yeah. of young men and women that are probably watching us right now. They need to learn how to proclaim the gospel. They shouldn't think this is only for a super spiritual crowd. They need to start preaching. They need to go out in the open air or even go to their pastor and then intimidate him into <laughs> giving him a chance to give their testimony. We need to hear from more people, including the younger generation. I find this in uh, East Africa. You go through East Africa and a man will come up to you and say, my name is John Wangi. I became a follower of Jesus on the so-and-so, the so-and-so. You know, and it's lovely to hear those testimonies. People can be very, very bold. But also the willingness, when necessary, to defend ourselves. Again, we're given the idea that if we're really spiritual, we never defend ourselves. And that often leads to a lot of confusion because to resolve problems, we need to talk, we need to speak. What if, like my wife uh, tells me I've done something wrong and I just clam up? You know, I'm going to take this persecution <laughs> from my wife. We, we, if anything, in our marriages, I've had 48 great years with the same woman, hallelujah. We need to keep talking. No. We shouldn't clam up and think that's the more spiritual road. Sometimes it is a spiritual way just not to defend yourself. Other times you need to speak the truth and try to get the situation in love sorted out. Yeah. Mm. Then at the moment, of course, then violence breaks out. Like in here, in chapter 22, verse 22, the crowd listened to Paul until he said this. Then they raised their voices and shouted, rid the earth of him. He's not fit to live. Mm. As they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust into the air, the commander ordered Paul to be taken into, into the barracks. And he's about to be flogged. Then Paul kind of uh, checks him and says, uh, uh, is this legal? Is yeah. Roman yeah. citizen? Yeah. Uh, Wise as serpent, harmless as doves. Yeah, <laughs> yes. that's all right. 
That's what's going on, isn't it? That when Jesus said we should be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. So Jesus is saying, look, you know, think about how to use the situation wisely and carefully. But, don't, you know, don't be manipulated. Don't harm people, but be wise, be clever. Also, be aware of, the, of legal things as well, which Paul does that. He's very aware of, of legal situation and, and makes the most of that. And I think it's great when Christians, uh, there's, you get Christian lawyers who'll defend people and stand up to situations. We can write about all sorts of different situations in the world and plead the cause of people who've been imprisoned who are being persecuted and things like that. It's right to do that, to to intervene and say, hang on a minute, is this legal? Is the actually I don't think that's acceptable that you've imprisoned that person. We know about this. We're writing to you. We want to complain about it. I think that's all right to do that, to be a work to engage with the world that we're in. He wants to try to say I've you know, been able to write to, say, the prime minister of some country where there's persecution going on, and it seems the right thing to do, at least a challenge, it is. even at the, just only, only to satisfy your conscience. Mm. Yeah. Uh, We've seen that in modern Turkey, where there is actually quite a lot of freedom in the Constitution, but the extro- extreme Muslims don't want that. And I know that in a number of cases, when we've actually showed them the Constitution or quoted the Constitution, they've backed off. And there's been some real victories in Turkey. There's a major court case going on right now over the three who were martyred a a couple years ago. But I think there's a lot of wisdom here, as there is throughout the whole book of Acts. And it's all a lot more relevant for us today than I think people realize. It it has become a neglected book. Mm. In fact, the whole Bible is more (laughs) more or less a neglected book. I take surveys in my meetings all over the world in churches and usually less than half the people have ever read the Bible through once. Yeah. I often offer a hundred pound to anybody who'll do it in a year, which I'm not doing right now. <laughs> but uh, it's amazing the ignorance of the scriptures and just the lack of reading of the scriptures in our day. And I believe we're paying a terrible price mm. for this biblical ign- uh, Bible ignorance. Mm. Well, Paul is very straight here. I mean, in chapter 23, verse the first 10 verses, he takes on the Pharisees and the, and the Sadducees and actually he kind of provokes a bit of discussion between them, an argument between them. Uh, then it goes on to the, what I think we could call the, almost the suicide squad of chapter 3, verse 12, and 40 men say, oh, look, we're taking a vow to kill, to kill Paul. That shows the intensity of the opposition. Uh, it also shows, I suppose, how it can be clothed with the order and respectability, you know, of the, the Roman Empire. I mean, in the light, George, of Acts 23, with all of this going on, how... Sh- any more tips as to how we deal with such opposition? God's put this in his word for a purpose. I've, I've preached on this chapter to Christian leaders for the last 50 years all over the world. And I tell them, just as there was a conspiracy against Paul, 40 men said they're not even going to eat, not even, you know, not even at McDonald's. They're not going to eat until Paul is dead. That's serious. And I say, look, if you go back to your home tonight, And when you get to your house, there's a note on the door signed by 40 of your neighbors. They're not going to eat until you're dead. I dare to say even the most laid back Englishman, his his metabolism is liable to to go up at that moment. (laughs) And I believe there is a conspiracy against Christian leaders. I've seen it against leaders in my own fellowship. And therefore, we need to be more diligent. We need to be more alert. We need to be more accountable. We need to take what we're doing much more seriously. The big buzzword today is fun, and I'm not against using the word fun, and part of the Christian life is fun, but I think it's got to extreme now that uh, everything has got to be fun. We, we're in a tremendous life and death battle. Yeah. People are dying. Even as we sit here making this program, people are suffering. We need to be more serious about our faith and more careful, especially in the area of moral purity. I usually turn my message to the fiery dart of impurity that has wiped out thousands of leaders around the world just in the last decade. And I've had terrific feedback concerning how the Holy Spirit uses this passage. It's relevant today. This is not a bit of history about Paul. This is relevant today, and Christian leaders need to take heed, Mm, including me. Hugely so. There's a great comfort there, isn't there? Take courage, chapter 23, verse 11, as the Lord says to him, take courage, as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. The Lord stands by him and makes uh, and, and gives him that extra comfort. He's not alone in all of this. I think when we think of all of this, 
Let's end our fast study. I'll tell you what, let's do a memory verse. What about a memory verse? To commit to memory. I think we will take Acts 14, verse 22. When Paul and Barnabas, Paul had just been left for dead, he's recovered, and then they go to the next place, and what do they say? They say, Acts 14, 22, through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. That is to say, the road to the, to the kingdom of God is laced with tribulation, often testings, difficulties, persecutions. We're not to be surprised. Through many tribulations, the word in tribulation in the Greek means stamping, threshing, grinding, squeezing. Well, we know about that in the Christian church, what it is to be squeezed. It's not a surprise. It's not a surprise. Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. And what makes it all worthwhile is the presence of the one who stands by us all the time. Amen.